Uh, so, I'm going to read this because Kim has a gift of the gab. Right. And she kindly wrote the introduction for me. Okay. <laughs> Still trying to get my breath. Um, God, I gave up smoking like four, four months ago. It's crazy, isn't it? Artificial insemination and breeding management with Greg Fawcett. That's why you're in the room because you selected this topic. So Greg is a um, technician in AI working mostly with cattle, or well, only with cattle. Only with cattle, yes. Only with cattle, there you go. So just curiously, hands up, how many of you utilise AI in your business? Not many. So any of you have managed it yourself? Yep. Okay. So Greg has devoted more than 40 years to support cattle breeding through AI. And in fact, he's been instrumental in the adoption and use of fixed time artificial insemination. Are you guys doing that as well? Technology in Northern Australian cattle breeding, <coughs> resulting in greatly reducing timelines for producers as all of their cows or heifers can be inseminated on a single day. Think about that. How many cows and heifers do you have insemination on a single day? Um, so I've been on good authority that this has been averaged out to about 6,000 head per year. For me to do, yeah. Yeah, for mm. you to do. Um, that you've been responsible for inseminating. So after some calculations based on my assumptions that are equate to about 500 per month, 6,000 divided by 12, 500 a month, or 125 per week, based on a five day working week, that would work out to 25 a day. Um, now I can't imagine that you'd want to inseminate cattle for more than five hours a day. So that'd be about five per hour, which further breaks down to one every 12 minutes. <laughs> Yeah. No, not in those terms, but in, 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 in reality, yeah. So I'm going to hand it over to Greg because he obviously knows how this all functions. Okay, well thank you for that introduction and kind words. Um, in reality it's a, a tightened up breeding season so it's not so many per day or, or so many per, per week but it uh, comes back to so many per hour and a uh, proficient technician is capable of doing one a minute. So that's provided you've got support to uh, put the cattle through the crush and someone thawing the semen and loading the guns. So I, when I'm doing larger mobs, I budget on one a minute in terms of turnover and we have a four hour window to get them done. So that limits the number of animals you can do in one program and one session to <coughs> around 200, 250, 250 is comfortable. Okay. Righto, so when it comes to using AI in the cattle industry, a little bit of history first. So it started out in the dairy industry primarily, and one of the reasons it started out in the dairy industry was to avoid a sexually transmitted disease that most of us would know as Vibrio. These days it's called Campherbacter. Okay, so by taking the natural mating out of the equation, they were able to control that disease in the early days. Then of course it came to pass that um, by using semen of particular bulls that had better qualities in terms of what people were selecting cattle for, um, you could breed better progeny. And so it's grown from that. So it's been used extensively in the dairy industry for a long, long time. And then it trans transferred itself into the beef industry, particularly initially in the stud or seed stock sector. Okay. And now it is also used in the commercial area where there is a benefit for producing progeny of particular proven bulls. So a case in point for that in today's market would be the, the Wagyu. So Wagyu breeders get a premium price for better performing progeny from proven bulls. Now for a bull to be proven in the dairy industry, he had to be six years old because you've got to have had daughters that have done a year's milking or a year's lactation and then and all that evaluation has been established and that's how that animal became a proven bull. So in the dairy industry still to this day, the top breed in the world is still the Frisian in terms of dairy and the top proven Frisian bull for a particular year based on the production of his daughters um, will sell as much semen as they can physically extract from that animal. 
once he's proven. So AI centres around the world have progeny test schemes that uh, try and establish the best Frisian bull, and if they happen to pick that bull and successfully breed that bull, it is a multi-million dollar business because they will sell an awful lot of semen in that year. Next year, it'll be a different bull. Okay, so that's how it works in intensive livestock. Okay. So if you're running AI programs, it's all about being able to access better genetics. Okay, that's what it's all about. Because if you go and buy a bull to run with your cows, you've made a decision, you're committed to that bull, and you don't know to a large extent what he's going to perform like until you see the calves. So there's a, a fair delay there. And if things haven't worked out well, it's a major setback, okay? So to be able to predict that sort of thing too is, is now coming to the fore scientifically, okay? So just some basic maths. If you buy a bull and you put him with single sire mate, you might put him with say 50, maybe an absolute max of 70 cows, get something like 45 to 60 calves a year from that bull. If you put your bull in a multiple size situation, say at 4%, he's going to be exposed to, say, 25 cows on average. Some will get more, some will get less, some will get none in a multiple size situation. But you're going to end up with, say, 22 calves, just say, for example, a year from that bull. If we put this same bull in an AI centre, and collect semen, huge range in the amount of straws a bull's capable of producing in a collection, but average would be around 250 straws a week, only collected once a week. If you collect them too frequently, you get a lot more fluid, but not much more individual sperm cells. So there's no point going through the process, dirtying the equipment, and only ending up with not many more straws. 250 straws a week, Put that over your ear, you're looking at an excess of 10,000. Okay, 10,000 straws. 10,000 straws. And we always budget when we're breeding cattle on a 50% conception. That's 5,000 calves from one bull. And of course the other thing with AI is you're not geographically limited. So once semen is frozen, it can be moved around subject to the health status of the bull it was taken from, and that also includes internationally, okay? So if the bull's collected here in Queensland, he can be used anywhere pretty much on the eastern seaboard. The only limitation on him going, say, to WA, once again, health things, would be yonis. So he'd have to be tested free of yonis prior to being collected. Um, similarly for semen, moving in and out of Australia, it's all subject to health testing. So you can use an identified superior bull can be so much more widely used within the cattle population by using artificial breeding technology. So that's the bull side of it, and that's been evolving and going along now for, we're using straws and the same basic technology, putting semen in straws for, since the late 60s. Okay, so we've been using that technology to breed cattle. Been importing semen since the late 60s legally. Um, so some of the first breeds to come into Australia, and I'm old enough to remember it, so we had a lot of Charolais semen come in in the late 60s. And then other European breeds have come in. Uh, there's always been Brahmin coming from America. There's been Angus coming from New Zealand, Canada. Okay, uh, there has been semen come from parts of Europe, it just depends on the health status of their cattle herds at the time. So we've had issues with things like mad cow disease and that sort of thing, okay? Previously also we used to be able to import live animals. So when I first started working in central Queensland in the 90s, they were still importing um, Brahmin bulls from Texas and um, that trade ceased with uh, mad cow disease. So you can no longer bring the live animal into Australia, you can only bring in frozen semen and or embryos, provided they have come from animals that have been cleared for um, and meet Australian entry requirements in terms of their disease status, health status. 
Okay, so it's a huge international trade, genetics, and um, a lot of semen coming into Australia, less semen going out of Australia, but we do out of Queensland export semen to other mainly tropical parts of the world. We collect and, and um, process and, and distribute semen from, from tropical breeds um, to places like Asia, Central and South America and South Africa. Okay, so they've been fairly major markets for Queensland-based semen over the years. Right, eh? So that you can just see from that the sort of multiplication that, that is capable from one animal. Now, because of that, you have to be very particular in your selection of that animal that you're going to do that with, because you can spread faults just as quickly as you can spread improvements. So all sorts of measures are in place to make sure that that animal is sound, doesn't carry any genetic faults, and um, is going to go ahead and contribute to improving your cattle herd. Okay. Um, when you get involved in the stud game, it gets a little more complicated because not only do you um, buy straws of semen, but if you're registering cattle, you also are buying the registration rights to, from the owner of that semen or that bull to um, carry on and, and register the resulting progeny. So that's another, another story again. So, Greg, yes. Mm. What, what's the cost? What are the basic costs involved if you were buying in straws, for example? Okay, well, market forces prevail, so it's supply and demand. Um, there's some semen from recently collected semen of a bull that's of genetic value, um, whether that be measured through schemes like breed plans, so you've got all of this data on the bull and his relatives to support the genetics that you're purchasing, or whether it's just purely on um, visual appraisals, structural soundness and all that basic stuff, you're probably looking at paying at least $35, some, maybe up to $55 a straw, okay? Um, in, in some of the more elite stud situations, you can pay um, American Brahmin, for example, it's been 100 US a straw for a long time, and some of them also put minimum buys on, so you can't just go along and buy one straw from the owner of that semen, you have to buy a minimum of 20. And then when you go to register the calves that are produced, you might have to pay another $100 a calf to get a bit of paper issued so that you can register that calf with a breed society. Is that okay. like their pedigree? Like yes, yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, yeah. same, same deal. Um, so that, that's the sort of uh, cost involved in purchasing semen. So, um, and then you see semen sell for ridiculous sums of money. So I know next week there's a, a Wagyu conference in Melbourne and some Wagyu straws have sold for you know, 20, 30,000. Um, and you would not AI with that. So what's happened also in artificial breeding is the female side of things has also developed in terms of multiplying females. So you will have all heard of IVF in people. Well, that technology is now used in cattle. All right, so there's a couple of providers. There was, there was more, but there's one main provider in Queensland now, it's called IGT. And Inventure Genetic Technologies, and what they'll do is from your superior cow, they will remove eggs from her embryos using an ultrasound machine for guidance and a, a needle with vacuum on it to suck the eggs out, and um, collect harvest eggs. They will assess them, mature the good ones, fertilise them in a laboratory situation with straw of frozen semen. So if you've got your expensive straw of semen, you might be able to fertilise 20 or more of these eggs, okay, with one straw. And that's how you can justify some of that expensive semen, okay. Um, and then they'll um, grow them out to seven days of age, either freeze them or put them straight into a, a recipient or surrogate mother, okay. So that technology is being widely used, widely used and used more and more. And as a result of that, now if you go to a breed society sale or they'll even have dedicated heifer sales where you'll see female cattle, stud cattle, now selling for twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a head because the purchaser knows that they can take that animal home and multiply it rapidly. Okay. What's the largest breed in an embryo of the breed? So once it's frozen, it lasts for 
for a long time, okay, indefinitely. But if it, it, oh no, more than that. Um, yeah, look, um, I've, it's the same technology as freezing semen, and I've been using semen. I used some semen a couple of months ago, old Brahmin semen that's not even in straws. It's frozen in little pills. It's that old, and it would have been processed in the late 60s. So yeah, I've got pregnancies with that. Yeah. So and. We, we haven't lived long enough yet to know how long it's going to last, but at this stage it, it just lasts, yeah. just lasts, yeah. So provided it's kept below minus 120 degrees Celsius and doesn't get um, exposed or anything, it, it just remains frozen and, and as it was when you put it in there, okay? <clears throat> right -o. So that Egg, Eggs would be the same too. Well, they actually make them into embryos, they don't freeze eggs. So they make them into well, embryos and freeze the em so they're fertilised eggs. Yeah, yeah, well, probably changing the women, women now will fr freeze their, hold their eggs mm. and they're not fertilised. Mm. How long do they last for the I would imagine that once they're cryogenically preserved, it would be the same. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yep. <coughs> Some people now are even doing the sex thing as well. Have yeah. You, you, much of that. Okay, so the, the question from Rodney was about sex semen. It is possible, semen is what determines whether you're going to have a male or female progeny. So there's male and female sperm. Okay, and you can put them through a machine and separate them. So there's a company in America called Sexing Technologies who hold the worldwide patents and they have these machines that work on passing a bit of an electrical current through as far as I know and one side's attracted to positive and one to negative. So you can separate the sperm cells out of a sample by running them through these machines, okay? Um, I have visited that facility twice in Texas and uh, they don't let you any closer than about oh, 20 or 30 metres from their gear, okay? Um, and, uh, but no, it works well. They've spread right around the world. There are machines in Victoria and they're looking at the proposal of putting one in Rockhampton, but that hasn't come to pass yet. But they need volume of throughput to justify having a machine. So the obvious ones that use sex semen a fair bit is the dairy industry because they're looking to get female calves primarily. Okay. Um, I've used some female sex semen in research projects recently where we're trying to up the numbers of female calves for the project. Okay, so that was sexed beef master semen from the states that we're putting into drought master, okay? Now, it's not all bells and whistles in terms of using sex semen because when you put it through that process, it does knock it around a little bit. So your conception rates come off about 10%, okay, in terms of the number of pregnancies you'll, you'll get so from 40, using it. That's 40%. Yeah, 40, 45. So I did a program at Gainda back um, just before Christmas, They're having a really good season down there. The cattle presented <coughs> really well. It was a fixed time program on cows and um, only that one bull we used with sex semen, we used a range of other bulls and three breeds, um, averaged a bit over 60%, was the best result we've ever got on one mating and um, the sexed ones were about 45%. So that just reflects that that's how, how that works and that's what you have to expect if you use that product. <coughs> slightly lower. Yeah, yeah. 10 to 10, at least 10 percent, budget on at least 10 percent less. So the, 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 the great sex is 100 um, percent? A bit over 90 percent, yeah, yeah, so it's not perfect, yeah, yeah. I mean I did have, when I worked at Beef Breeding Services, um, sold some sex, we didn't collect it of course, but it, it came in through our system, um, some sex semen to a lady who wanted to put it in a house cow, so it was dairy semen and she wanted to breed some heifers so she had, could replace that cow and got two bull calves. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's not perfect, but it is yeah, better than 90%. That was just bad luck in that, in that circumstance. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so that's, that's where we're at in terms of the use today of artificial breeding technology, particularly in the beef industry, is that we're now using the IVF and there's still conventional embryo flushing going on as well in, in beef cattle. So that's where you super ovulate your donor cow, make her release lots of eggs, AI her at least twice within a 24 hour period, and then seven days later, rinse out her uterus and 
flush out all of the embryos. So that technology has been around for a long time. Um, it's a little more invasive on your good cow because you are giving her hormones to make her produce all of these eggs and you're um, flushing out her uterine environment. Okay? But there is still a, a fair bit of that going on, conventional yes. embryo transfer. And the risk is that those, men, those cows will come in better because mm. of all of the manual intervention that's happened over her. You have to be careful with your dose rates when you superovulate, or you can end up with cystic ovaries. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Righto. So that's, um, that's where we're <laughs> at in terms of, of reproductive technology with artificial breeding. Now, applying that, and I'll talk mainly about the AI side of things. There are two things that we try and maximise. A submission rate and a conception. Sorry, mate, just to go back, when you yep. have the uh, bull that is 4%, 24 cows, what do you mean here with the... Uh, um, so if, if you've got 100 head breeders, yeah. or 200 head of yeah. breeders so in a big paddock, you might put six or eight bulls in, you know, yeah, to cover them. Because if it's in a big paddock, yeah. you'll have some over here and some over there, and yeah. But what happens is with bulls and dominance, you'll end up with some pushing others out of the way. And you'll, it's been, since the advent of DNA, you can work out whose calves are whose. Yeah. So you might put eight bulls in there and you'll find out that three or four of them got most of them, a couple others got a few, and one or two might have got none. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. And that, that's, uh, that's what happens. <coughs> okay, so when you're running an AI program, <coughs> the main topic is who's on heat today, so we can AI it, get it out of the road. Okay? That is the main topic. And to increase your submission rate, there's a lot of different factors that you cover to do that. Right, what so. exactly is actually coming into season. Yeah. Okay. So they've got to come into season. Yeah. So your cow, your mature cow, is going to come on heat roughly every 21 days if she's not pregnant. And anything between 18 to 24 is normal. So if she comes on heat every 18 days, there's nothing wrong with her. If she comes on heat every 24 days, there's nothing wrong with her. So in biology, everything works over a range of time. And they'll show signs of that heat for anything from 6 to 30 hours. Okay? So signs of heat, behavioural change. When an animal's on heat, it'll stand still, primarily we look for standing heat. Stand still to let the bull mount and serve it. Right? Or if you're in a, a bull-free environment where you're trying to run an AI program, females ride females. Okay? So that standing heat is what you're looking for to base your AI on. Greg, has that got anything to do with fertility of the cow? Um, getting them to actually coming on heat, yes. Yeah. So, and, so, and when they start coming on heat, what age they start yeah. coming on heat, yeah. um, how soon after they carve they start coming on heat again. Yeah. Okay. But, but if you're more, more fertile cow, would they be 24 hours uh, come on a 18, 18 days and last for 30 hours? Or Not necessarily, no. That's more of a, a strain of cattle thing and an age of cattle thing. So the ones that might show the shortest periods of heat would be a Brahmin heifer. Yeah. Okay? So, and and Bos indicus cattle or tropical cattle don't show as vigorous signs of heat as Bos taurus cattle. So in Bos Taurus, cattle start bellowing, they'll bellow, they'll urinate, they'll run around looking for a bull. Yeah. Okay, your Brahmin heifer, you might see her ridden a couple of times if you're watching closely and yeah, that's, that's it. Okay. So yeah, but this, no. Anything in that range is normal. Anything in here, cows will show longer um, signs of heat for longer than maiden heifers. Okay. <clears throat> so that's, that's um, what we're looking for in terms of when we can breed our animal. Now you can, you can influence all of this by introducing artificial hormones, injecting them in them, putting them in as implants, and shorten up this 21 days of work to as little as four hours, okay? So the more you spend on drugs, 
the shorter your time of observation, or not even observation, but of insemination. Okay? Right, so the simplest form of synchrony was a thing called the 10 day program, which has been around as long as I have. And instantly you've halved your labour time. You've only got to look at your mob of cattle for 10 days and AI. All right? And that's by using a drug called prostaglandin. So you watch them for five days. And then on the end of day five, those that haven't come on heat, they get PG injection and watch down to day 10. Okay? So <clears throat> when we watch cattle for signs of heat, those who've been around cattle a bit know that they come on heat primarily sunrise, sunset, and some of our Brahmin heifers in the middle of the night. Okay? Um, so if you're going to do any sort of program other than fixed time where you have to observe heat, you have to put the time into watching them and identifying them and knowing who's doing what. And the other factor is that when you see the animal on heat and stand to be ridden, that's not when you AI it. Okay? That's when a bull would mate it. But with AI, we go further into the track than the bull. So I was the only bloke that flew from Rocky to Mackay last night with a rubber <laughs> uterus in their baggage. Um, <laughs> okay, so this represents an empty reproductive tract of a cow. So the vulva was back here, where my right hand is. In the middle here, the vagina, then we have the cervix. Okay, now the cervix is a gristly sausage shaped structure inside the cow there, between the vagina and the uterus, and it's a seal. So the vagina is considered outside world, the uterus is an internal organ. And this cervix prevents outside material getting into an internal organ and causing infection. Right? Now to artificially inseminate an animal, we breach that seal by passing our AI gun through there and putting the semen actually in the uterus of the cow. When a bull mates a cow, he leaves the semen on the other side of the cervix, on the outside. And what happens when a cow's on heat, you would have all seen from time to time mucus discharge or bulling strings. And the semen gets onto that mucus and swims up through the cervix and into the uterus and on around right up both of these horns and up to where the ovaries are on the end here. Okay? And the ovary duct, the little vein structure between the ovary and the tip of the uterine horn is where fertilisation takes place. So that's where the semen and egg meet. All right. Then you get this little embryo form, it floats down here and after about nine days it'll actually attach to the side of the uterus and start to grow as a pregnancy. But before that it's just floating around. So it was conceived in the fallopian tube? It's conceived up in the fallopian tube, yep. Yep. So <clears throat> I wrote on the board there before that we can get enough semen, when you, when you collect a bull's semen, you get enough to make 250 straws. And the reason that we can take a lot of the inefficiency out of it is that the bull drops all this semen here in the vagina, only a small percentage of it gets to survive and swim up through the cervix and go on to contribute to getting a cow and calf. Whereas with AI, we eliminate all that inefficiency and give it a head start. Now because of that, we have to delay. So if we see our cow on heat, in the morning, we AI her that evening. If we see her on heat in the evening, we AI her the next morning because we're giving that semen a head start. All right? If we put it in there too soon, by the time the egg is released from the ovary, the semen will have lost vitality and you won't get a pregnancy. So timing is very important in terms of when you AI. Okay? Now your AI gun, right? and this one's done a lot, they always end up with a little bend in them for some reason. But your AI gun is passed through that cervix and it's a gristly sausage structure with one-way valves in it and you, you have to wriggle past all these flaps of gristle and end up with it lying inside like that. Okay? And that's where you dispense your semen. So particularly if it's fixed time AI, you put all of the semen in the uterus. The semen you put in the uterus is going to be the, the semen that's going to get the job done. With some techniques of AI, we also leave some in the cervix on the way out, judged just on the length of that plunger. So that's full dose, that's right in. Okay? So that's, um, that's why we have this um, timing issue. It's a thing called the AMPM rule. 
with another pen. So if you're doing heat detection, you work on a thing called the AMPM rule. Okay. So with our 10 day program, it's going to cost you, um, all of these hormones are S4. So they have to be obtained from a vet and the vet's got to be familiar with you, your practices, your management for them to prescribe you the drugs. Okay. Um, and prostaglandin is probably going to cost you maybe three, maybe four dollars. If you're buying a whole lot of it, probably less per head. So it's not expensive to sync up some cattle and run a 10 day program. You have to be very careful with using this prostaglandin drug because if you make a mistake and you accidentally inject a cow that's already in calf, okay, if she's early in calf, she'll abort. If she's close to calving, she'll calve. If she's mid-term, you may get away with it. But it is a risk, okay? Now, <clears throat> South American technology, um, they developed a thing called fixed time AI. And that has been adapted and used now in Australia in the extensive grazing areas. I was involved in some of the early work that was done at Cloncurry in a place called Tara Station, a fellow called Dan Lynch. And initially we weren't sure how many we could do at once. And we had two operators there, two races, two crushes off his pound. And we pulled on 100 each and that was quite comfortable. Okay. But what doing fixed time AI involves is basically synchronising the ovulation of the animal. And that is done by using a 10 day lead up prior to the day of AI of regime of hormones. And it involves always using a progesterone based implant that is placed in the vagina of the cow. And basically progesterone pregnancy hormone is a blocking hormone. So it works exactly the same as in people the contraceptive pill. So while that's present, no ovulation. Okay, just stops everything until you take it out. So that is soaked in pregnancy hormone. This is the first type that came out and I use these for um, different forms of synchrony in the 90s. Okay, worked really well in Bostaurus cattle. Everything came on heat, all sorts of cattle will come on heat. Bostaurus cattle you still get acceptable conception rates. Bosyndicus, these were too strong. Too much residual hormone after you pulled them out and we run into issues with poor conception rates. Everything come on heat, so you got in there and AI'd it and everything looked great, but disappointing conception rates. As a result of that, drug companies are pretty switched on. Um, they brought out lower dose implant devices. So this one here is called a Q-Mate, and it's set up there for doing a cow. It's got two white pods on it. So these things on the end here are hormone soaked. This pregnancy hormone is safe for me to handle. Okay. And when you do a heifer, they want less again. So you put a blank on there, right, for maiden heifers. And these work well. Also, these can be cleaned and reused. So if you've got a strong stomach, when you've pulled this out, it's been inside a cow's vagina for nine days, you pull it out and you can rinse it off, wash it, clean it up in some antiseptic, let it uh, dry in the shade, put it away and use it again in the next program. So you can get two uses out of any individual pod that way. Okay, so that's a Q-Mate and you're going to pay about, oh, depending on how many you buy, but probably somewhere between 15 and $16 per device. Okay. With the needles, yep, yep. That's progesterone. That's progesterone, yep. Hmm. Okay, another brand, another device, another company. This one is called a Dib. Now there's two versions of these. There's Dib V, which is full strength, and there's Dib H, which is H stands for half. Now these are the ones that we use in the beef industry in Queensland, and particularly in tropical breeds, and also in heifers. Okay, as another source of low-dose progesterone if you're going to sync up cattle 
leading to a fixed time program. Okay, and the difference with these is they're cheaper, but they're one use only. So when you pull it out of the cow, it's straight in the bin. Okay. <clears throat> Righto. So what we can end up doing by using those and a combination of in injections, provided your property is not European Union accredited and you're not tied up with the European market, you can use a conventional fixed time program using estradiol. Now estradiol is estrogen, right? Estrogen is a natural occurring, occurring hormone in all females. So ovaries produce oestrogen and they house eggs, all right? So just to get off topic a little bit for, for a minute, ovaries with all these eggs, okay, they don't make more eggs as the female goes through life. The ovaries, the female is born with all of its eggs present, okay? Unlike males that continue to make fresh semen as they go along all the time, um, females are born with all their eggs there, okay? So other than housing eggs, ovaries produce female hormones, so the animal they're in grows, develops and behaves like a female. Okay? Now by administering this externally, we can synchronise up their reproductive cycle. So a combination of estradiol and an implant on day zero, we call it start on day zero. Okay. It, finishes up a cycle that she might be in the middle of and blocks it, okay? So she's there now ready to react at the other end of our program. So that's day zero. On day eight, we remove that implant. And we give them an injection of that prostaglandin, which is the same one I talked about earlier, that can cause abortions and we give them an injection <coughs> of a product called Novamon, which is an ECG, which helps mature the follicle, ready for release, which housing the egg. Day nine, we give them another injection of estradiol. And then on day 10, you AI the lot in a four hour window. Okay, so that's basic fixed time AI for non EU applications. And from the time you do this. Okay. If you're doing a couple of hundred, what do they do? Let them out and hold them back or leave them in the yard and feed them, or what do they do? Um, Normally, you might hold them for this last three days somewhere handy, but certainly from there to there, day eight, day zero to day eight, bush. Yeah. Because mm. the issue is on most places that you don't have a lot of feed in closed paddocks, yeah. and uh, that you know if you've got to hand feed them, that's an added expense to the to the program and added stress as well. Okay, so that's our basic uh, fixed time regime. We AI, depending on which implant you use, 54 to 58 for a cumate. This is ours. Or 52 to 56 for a dib H. Hours after you pull the device in the needle. Okay? And you've got a, that four hour window to do the job. So, what this technology has done, as I said earlier, has enabled the application of AI to more commercial environments. And it allows animals to be treated as a mob rather than watching for heat, drafting, AIing half a day later, and seen much more widespread adoption of artificial breeding technology in the beef industry as a result of this. Okay? Um, when it, we first started, the drug companies were telling us we had a six hour window to AI. And I've been involved with a research project, um, AIing, I do about oh, 700 head a year, and, um, or 700 inseminations a year just on this research project. And 
we found, we measured everything, that insemination is done after that four hours, the conception rates started to decline. So we tightened it up to four hours from six hours, okay, and our results have been quite repeatable and acceptable. Okay. So if you're going to do one of these sort of programs, all that information is available through me in terms of recipes and also through drug companies. Uh, the recipes and through your vet, the recipes are available. In terms of accessing the drugs, as I said, um, you need to get them from an AI centre through their vet or from another cattle vet that's familiar with your operation. And you can go ahead and, and run programs like that. Um, Right. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy to take questions as we go along. Yeah. 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 So, okay. anyone got any questions at this stage? Just your heifers are slightly shorter with your hourly time, Greg, aren't they? Um, well, I don't. We have started half an hour earlier to no detriment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So it's more just the, the less the drugs. So yeah. Mm. It's more, it's more to do with heifers, your dose rates vary um, with some of the injectable drugs as well. All of the injectable drugs, as I said, you've got to get from your vet, all the injectable drugs have to be administered intramuscle, so deep in the muscle, okay, not just under the skin. They've got to go deep in the muscle to work. Okay? If you... <coughs> safest in the rump. Breeding stock, you're not going to eat them next week, so, yeah. It's safer there in most situations, unless your crush is set up for it. Other places people needle is uh, at the back of them, down that far from the tail into the high on the leg. Yeah, needle in there as well. Yeah, it just depends on your facilities. The safety with the PG, yep. make sure you wear gloves, and particularly there's been people that have had um, asthma attacks with mm. aspirated PG. Yep. Yeah. I mean, all drugs, but those in particular. Yeah, so one of these drugs in particular, prostaglandin, is quite dangerous. Um, it's going to have the effect on a, a breeding age person, woman, the same effect as it has on the cow. Yeah, so if she happened to be pregnant and spilled some on her hand, she'd lose a baby. Yeah, really? okay. um, yeah. If, if so you're. So usually I would recommend on properties that um, ladies don't go anywhere near that stuff, and if there's men around, yeah. they should handle it, but still take precautions in terms of wearing gloves, having water handy if you did spill some to wash it off. Okay, and the other thing, it causes contraction of the smooth muscles, so bad for asthmatics. Really bad for asthmatics. Okay. And that's why they're S4 restricted drugs. And they're not just available off the shelf. Yeah. Yeah. So if they um, don't fall pregnant in Yep. Yeah, so the earliest they'll be back on heat is 18 days later, some of them. So 18 to 24 days later, if they're not pregnant, they'll be back on heat. The earliest you can preg test them with an ultrasound scanner is around that 28, 30 days. And when you do that, you're going to pick up in the uterine horn. You put a scanning probe like that and run it like this. And you will see on your screen black fluid inside that uterus. Okay, and any fluid comes up on an ultrasound is black. And the other thing you can do is look at the ovary for the, the um, what's called a corpus luteum, which grows on the ovary once an animal's pregnant. Okay, so um, that's the earliest you can pick up a pregnancy. In terms of picking it up the old way by putting on the shoulder length glove, okay, so you can go about six weeks and you will feel a difference in the size and structure of these two uterine horns. So the one, if the, um, 70 per cent of pregnancies occur on the right hand side because it's further away from the rumen and it'll just start to feel like a bit of swollen, um, start to go like a, a balloon with a bit of water in it. That's what it feels like. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But the other one will just feel flaccid. Yeah. So that's, that's the earliest you can pick up your, your pregnancies. There's a lot, lot more ultrasound going on now than there has been in terms of early pregnancy diagnosis. 
um, people are buying their own machines. Um, and uh, yeah, as long as you're using it properly and using it correctly, you'll... it's only really any good for early diagnosis. Once a pregnancy gets about so big and goes over the pelvic bone and down towards the cow's udder, it gets out of range. And particularly if you just put in a wand rather than putting your arm in, a wand with a scanner on the end of it, it won't read it because it's too far away. And you'll say, oh, there's nothing in there, she's, she's empty. In fact, she's pregnant, okay? So you've got to be careful of that. But they're really good for early diagnosis. I've got one and I only ever use it in my hand. So I don't use a wand, I put the scanner in my hand, go into the cow and put it where I want to see what's on the screen. Okay? Yep. Right, so the technology keeps evolving in terms of, of fixed time AI. So we've now got a slow release drug we can give them on day eight instead of giving the estradiol on day nine. We give them a slow release estradiol on day eight. And that was used in limited quantities for the first time this last breeding season. So I've done about uh, 600 head, I suppose, with that. I haven't got any results to tell you, but I know that it has worked in South America, so that should replicate itself in Australia just the same. What it does, it means one less stock handling, okay, which is good because it's less stress on the animals. By the time you've run them through the crush, and the last three times you've run them through the crush before you AI, you've hit them with a needle. So you bring them in on AI day, and particularly Brahmins, they tend to look at you a bit and don't really want to go up and get another needle. Okay, so there's advantages there, one less stock handling and a bit less stress. Okay, so that technology is evolving now. Um, product called Cipiacin, which is a low dose estradiol. If you're on an EU accredited property, which means European Union, your product could go to the European Union, you are not allowed to use this estradiol product. So you have to use an alternative called GNRH, and it's not, unfortunately, it's not as effective. So you do get slightly reduced results. If you're running, and you also end up having to AI over about a 24 hour period, and you need to put these patches, there's a patch there like that, which sticks on the back of the animal, okay? And when an animal's ridden, it rubs, just like an instant casket ticket, rubs the gray off and there's a bright color revealed. So if you're doing EU programs or anything but estradiol fixed time, you need to also put these patches on and the ones that are triggered are the ones you treat at that time accordingly, okay? So when you're doing EU programs, we end up doing about three AI sessions. So one afternoon, the ones that are all triggered, the next morning, the ones that are all triggered and then that, that morning we'll hit them with another needle, the ones that aren't triggered and um, do them that afternoon. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even if you're just doing whatever sort of program and you need to heat detect, this device here is really handy called a yeah, ESA detector, ESA alert. Uh, they're probably $2.50 each. A lot of people will get two or three out of one sticker by cutting it up. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that, that does work. Um, but yeah, no, they are great. They work well, they stick on the animal well. Um, when you AI it and you want to take this coloured sticker off its back, it, it just about pulls the hair off. They, they do stick on quite well. Yep. Yeah. Greg, did I understand you correctly? If you're doing uh, a prep test, there's, <coughs> and, and they use, uh, you know, how they use the wand or whatever yeah, yeah. it is, that's, that's only applicable for if a, car, if a cow is very early. Uh, it's going to be easily easily visible if they're very early yeah. and even if they can see what you see on the screen if they're not pregnant is you see cross sections of this these horns so you see these little donuts yeah. and because it looks through that bit and then through that bit you'll see four donuts yeah. on the screen. Yeah but if they're six or eight months carved, it, no. you shouldn't use the glove. You won't, you won't see it with the scanner. So in other words, I've got to do a lot of them with the glove. Mm. Yep, yep, okay. yep. No, it's so just what's out of range. What's your time frame there to put the scanner? Sorry? What's your time frame to pick them up with the scanner? I think, you know, from four weeks, from definitely six weeks, four weeks experienced people, but six weeks through to three months. So there's a six week window there where they're really good. Then after that, um, if, if it's on a, on a probe, you'd have to 
They'd be leaving it up and pushing it right down like that to try and see down further. Yeah, yeah. So that can be done? Or... Oh, to a degree. But, I mean, you know, a scanner's... A scanner worth having... The Chinese one's going to cost you 12 grand. A Japanese one's going to cost you 28. That's worth having. That's 30 cents. Yeah. OK. So, yeah. I've seen more problems with inexperienced people with scanners getting it wrong than mm. inexperienced people with gloves. Yeah. Wonderful. We're going to have to there. Um, okay. We're probably going to walk in next door and Kim's going to be jumping up and down trying to get Roxanne to be quiet. Um, but thank you so much, Craig. And mm. Craig will be here for the rest of the day and he'll be joining us as well tomorrow for those of you who are coming to the field day at Mansfield Park. So, yeah. Yep. Awesome. No worries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.